Hi, everyone. I did a Q&A this evening. It was wonderful. So many people from all over the world showed up, but I forgot to turn on my camera for the first seven minutes. It was an excellent Q&A, lots of excellent questions. Uh, if you can't bear the sound at the beginning of it, just jump forward to seven minutes, 16 seconds, where everything cleans up. Anyways, I hope you guys recognize me. I'm wearing pink today, not my normal my normal colors. And you can see going quite gray. <laughs> I've got some friends that are using this pandemic to let their gray out. And uh, they're not going to color their hair anymore. So I'm wondering whether I should be part of that group. Anyways, so glad to see you all. So glad you can join me this Friday night. Isolation's getting pretty lonely and I'm glad you all showed up. Hi, Sue. <laughs> I've got one of your questions to answer here. Uh, we are in my studio, uh, nice and quiet, and it's just you and me this evening, nobody else. So, whoops, <laughs> that's maybe not at the best start, but uh, let's go. Uh, Michelle0358 had a question for me. Uh, what are the best purchases when starting stash building? Well, you want to keep your prints small. You don't want to have these big, big prints because those are not good. They're not really great for uh, quilting. Those are best for your back. I mean, they're beautiful. They make great shirts, they make good dresses, but they're not necessarily good for quilting. Oh, look at you all. Wisconsin, Florida, Virginia. I'm so glad you guys have all showed up. Oh, I hope you guys are having the same beautiful weather that we are having in Toronto. It's just wonderful right at the moment. Everybody's out in their garden. Of course, we can't go out much farther than that at this moment, but uh, uh, lots of visiting happening over the, over the fence. Oh, LaSalle, Queensland. Hello, Hazel. <laughs> <laughs> Massachusetts, Louisiana. I just love seeing you from all over the world. I just think this is such a global community and it's just so great to see you. Hawaii, aloha, Christine. Uh, Kendra Brown, excellent. Okay, so um, thank you all for showing up. Uh, I've got lots of questions that were asked today, so I'm going to try and just start going. Uh, pushing through them. Lots of very good questions, so I think this is going to be a great session. Uh, Betsy Sewing, she's from Spain, and she's asked me, she's a brand new quilter, and she's asked, uh, she's very insecure about color gradient choices, even after watching my color video series. Uh, what is the biggest mistake that new quilters make when it comes to color, and how can we get better faster? Uh, there's only so much faster you can get, but the biggest mistake that beginner quilters make, and I was certainly one of them, is that we buy our favorite colors in exactly the same hue, um, and whether we buy a tint or shade, we're always buying exactly the same color, because that's our favorite, right? So we buy it in a print, we buy it in solids, we buy them in big prints and small prints, and that's not enough to give you enough variety to make a quilt out of. So that's where this, this color tool comes in really handy. So for instance, if you like pink, you know, maybe uh, this pink is your favorite pink, but you, you buy fabrics, if they're all made out of that exact same pink, you're not gonna get a good variety. You need to buy this pink, and you need to buy this pink, or this pink, or how far away uh, your color zone is. Um, the other thing is you want to take a look at the back uh, because this is where the color harmonies are and depending on your comfort level you're also going to be wanting collecting colors in those various shades and tints and tones of the comp whether you doing a complementary one or an analogous one you need to be collecting those other colors too and that's the hardest thing for us um, is just getting out 
from choosing our favorite color over and over and over again. So um, I'll put a link when I put this on YouTube, this video on YouTube, I'll put a link to this three in one uh, color tool. Here it is, three in one color tool. Um, if you go back to my video on playing with fabric, it's also in the notes on that video and use those exercises. Those exercises you can do 15, 30 minutes at a time and they really will help your eye see all those colors. So thank you for that question, Betsy. Um, Marianne Bain asked me, what am I going to do with all my hexes? I posted a picture to Instagram the other day. I had this great big glass container filled with them and I'm making them during a lot of Zoom meetings lately. I actually don't have a plan for them yet. My intention was to, to make about five plastic bags of them. Um, I started making hexes when I realized I just didn't like sitting during guild meetings and other meetings, like sitting on the bus and that not having busy hands. So I just started making these hexes. Hi, Pearl. <laughs> Glad to see you show up. Uh, and I started making these hexes and I started grabbing scraps of pieces fabric from everywhere. I went scrap diving at the, the local quilt store and I, I'm just going to decide on it when it is. Karen says she still doesn't know how to use the green and plastic strips in this. These have to do with value. Um, back in the day before we had uh, cameras that we could take black and white photos, these were used, you put them over top of your fabric and what this does is this eliminates all the green in your the, the green tones in your quilt and this eliminates all the red and that just allows you to see a stronger variation to see the values um, and that's what that's for but if you're using a black and white camera you don't need to use these these are just as I say archaic um, they're a quick check but you don't need to use it Hello from New Brunswick. I know from New uh, Long Island in Elgin, Ontario, from Idaho. Welcome from Brampton. That's just around the corner. Beth Ann Collins uh, was wondering if she would, if I would share tricks or tips regarding keeping sashing straight and perpendicular. Okay, so I actually prepared something for this. So uh, this would be your square, and when you're putting sashing on. What you want to do is you want to mark the center point on the square. And then on your sashing, you also want to mark the center point. And then you just line them up and then you sew. And because you've marked the center part on the sashing, then you just line up the second block to that center point. And that's how you keep them square going across. Sorry, I'm not. Here we go, <laughs> trying to make this square. Um, now, for if you are doing a long piece of sashing, what you do is you mark the end points. You just make a, a mark on the sashing, what the distance of the block would be, and then you just mark it ahead of time, and that's how you line up your blocks going across. Um, when you're new to quilting, this will be a challenge because your blocks are not going to be square um, or they're just going to be a little bit large or a little bit small. Uh, don't stress about it, just work through it. Um, it's not going to be as noticeable as you think once it's all done um, and just put it up to experience and move on to the next quilt. Uh, I know in my first couple I did have sta sashing and stressed but again <laughs> those are beginner's mistakes. You will improve, your blocks will get squarer, your points will get pointier, uh, and your your 10th quilt will be so much better than your first couple. So, and your 20th quilt will be better than your 10th, and your 30th quilt will be better than your 20th. So, uh, just be uh, patient with yourself. Hello from Brazil. Isabella. Uh, another person from Queensland. <laughs> um, 
Do I have any cutting tip videos? I have not done um, how to cut straight yet. Um, it is in the works, but some very quick points on how to cut straight is make sure your ruler, your rotary blade is sharp. Make sure you are cutting fr away from you. Um, when you are moving, like you have a tendency to go forward and then off to the side. And when you do that, you put extra pressure on your ruler. Um, one thing I also have a big problem with is my table right by my sewing machine is not flat. And uh, uh, it's flat, sorry, but it's not stabilized. Uh, there's no legs at all four corners. So there's a lot of give in the table as I go through it. And that will make a big difference in your quilting. You, you will get wobbly edges. So I just have to be very careful to be straight on when I'm cutting and cutting away and making sure that I have pressure on my ruler to my fabric all the way along. And sometimes I stop in the middle and then I squiggle my hand up a little bit farther and that helps keep things straight. Okay. Um, Jean Eshelman says, when I go to sew anything, my machine foot tends to push the top fabric slowly out toward my left, but not my lower fabric. Uh, that's an issue with your sewing machine. It's an issue with your presser foot. There is a little bit of every machine kind of pushes it off to the side. Um, but it's just the way that your feed dogs are being fed through and the pressure um, of the presser foot may not be flat because uh, they feed them through a little bit differently. Uh, you should maybe use a walking foot that will help. That will help. Um, the other thing is, I don't know when the last time it was serviced. You might uh, take it into your um, to be serviced, have it cleaned, and just mention to the technician that you're having this problem, and he may be able to change the presser the pressure on that presser foot. So those are my my two recommendations there. Nancy Cox has asked about about batting. She always buys an 80-20 mix and she just received 100% cotton and she's worried about shrinkage. Um, should be concerned with that a large piece in a quilted throw. Um, all quilts are gonna shrink. I did a video last year on shrinkage. I took three quilts and I showed how using pre-wash fabrics ahead of time and non-pre-wash fabrics uh, made it shrink. I have going to do another one I'm going to do another one this year comparing other types of uh, batting. I just haven't got there yet. But if you are using um, unpre-wash fabrics, your quilt is still going to shrink a lot, whether you've got an 80-20 or you've got 100% cotton. But the, the cotton is going to shrink more, but that's the one I use. I only use 100% cotton and I really like the way the quilts turn out. So, uh, <sighs> Susan Connor has asked, uh, in one recent video, I was working with orphan blocks. It was in my after quilt and I was, uh, I was saying to get them to lie flat. I, in the after quilt, you need to have all your blocks lie flat. Uh, she saw me making some adjustments to the blocks and what was I actually doing? And how do you get random blocks to lie flat? Uh, what I was doing is I was squaring them up. I was uh, lying them on a cutting board and I was just uh, cutting them with, uh, by aligning them to the lines on the cutting board. And I was just making the pieces square. Now the pieces itself, the pieces are quite wonky within the block, but at some point you have to say, this is going to be square, at least the block, the one that I was making. So um, again, they were very wonky and I was using, uh, sometimes I was using pieces in between and then I, then again, I squared up along the whole long edge. There was a lot of squaring up uh, after I got to a certain point, but I just used the lines on my cutting mat and those were what I followed. And it really does lie nice and flat. I didn't have any problems quilting it. Often you'll get a little bulge here, or bulge there, but it really worked out well. Um, Kathy Miles has asked me, sorry, I've been sighing so much since isolation, it even scares me. 
my, my husband and my sons have been saying, <laughs> just keep looking at me. I just do these huge, big sighs all the time. Uh, sorry. Uh, Kathy Miles has said she is a beginner quilter and wondering whether mini quilts are a good place to start. Um, actually, that's the perfect place to start. There's so many of us, including me, that looked at our beds, saw a big bed, and thought that was a great place to, to make your, your first quilt. And it is quite a long, long experience. If you start with a small one, you learn so much on your first quilt in how to handle the fabric, and you, you begin to see how ironing is poor, important, and lining up corners are important, and it's just best to learn all those things on smaller quilts. Um, and then once you get your confidence up and once you feel like you're making good blocks, then start the bigger ones. So that's a very good idea. So Sue, Sue, Sue Moeller, okay, your question. You have a lot of orphan blocks from different quilts that I like to make into a quilt. Ideas on how to arrange them. Well, I have videos coming up on how to put orphan blocks together. So you can um, hang into that. But should the filler fabric be the same fabric? Um, when you're putting orphan blocks together, you're trying to find something common between them all. And I recommend using a very desaturated color. So you're looking at your grays, your tans, or things like that because you're wanting the blocks to pop. But there's a lot more to it than that. But uh, that's where I would go. So if you have a lot of warm blocks, you might want to go gray and um, have a, a stronger contrast, or you might want to go tan and support the colors within it. So just take a look at where you're wanting to go and choose a desaturated color from there. Heather Yarrow, she's asking, how do you center your quilt top on an after quilt uh, piece back? So most long armors, and I would say 99% of them, will not guarantee any kind of lining up uh, between the back piece and the front piece because it's just too big uh, an issue to deal with. Um, but uh, I think it was in my Stash Buster number two, I showed how I did align a strong um, horizontal line with a strong horizontal line on the back. But I would not be trying to square it. I would not be trying to line up centers. Now, it's not that it's impossible because certainly there are so many show winners that have done that, um, but it just takes time. So you actually have to uh, hand baste it and hand baste it in a number of different places so that it does not go at a square, okay? Um, I've got a Taylor. Taylor is not here in the studio, but she's remotely helping me produce this today. So a wave out there to, to Taylor, and she's just told me that there's a couple of questions here. Um, how do you combine two pieces of batting if they are too small? Um, I have a video on what to do with batting scraps. It's, uh, I believe the common term is franken batting as you piece them all together. But I show you how to do it there. Uh, you use a zigzag and there's a particular way of cutting it. So go take a look out at that video. Uh, when I put it on YouTube, I'll put the link down in the notes below. How often do I change my rotary blade? I have three rotary blades. Uh, they're just different sizes, different projects, but my main one I change once a week. And I usually try to alternate between my changing the blade on my 60 inch and my 45 inch. Um, there's nothing like using a sharp blade. And <laughs> I recommended uh, one of the top gifts I think you could get any quilter is just a set of 20 of those blades. Now, somebody recommended to me the other, um, a couple of uh, Q and A's ago about a, a sharpener, not the $70 one, but a $20 hand one. And I bought it, but I actually haven't used it yet. So when I use it, I'll let you know how it does. Uh, is there a difference between cotton and polyester thread? Yes, there is, but for a lot of us, it doesn't make a difference. I use polyester almost all the time. I buy it on a cone and I use it for quilting and I use it for piecing. Um, but I, 
I ha also have a selection of cotton threads that I use when I'm just trying to get that color more precise. So, um, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm just seeing more people come by. <laughs> <laughs> from all over the world. I'm just so pleased to see you all. Um, gee, I just sort of lost my place there. Um, so I'll let you know how the self-sharpening works, but stainless steel blades are not that expensive. You just have to wait for them to arrive from China. So uh, just buy them on Amazon. I'll put a link in, in the notes for the ones that I buy when I put this on YouTube. Uh, could you do a video on the quilt top, doing the sandwiching the layers in a small space? Um, in a couple of my videos, I've already shown how I put it together in a small space. I don't have a big floor area. I have a bed where I often lay things out, but that's not uh, a good idea to be laying out fabric on. I actually do it on the wall and I tape up my back fabric on the wall, then I spray base it and I put up my batting and I spray base it and then I put up my top. Um, I do bring it in and just press out any wrinkles because there are usually a couple of extra ones that I need to worry about on my dining room table, but then it's good to go. That's when I quilt it from home. Um, and that I believe is in Stash Buster number two and Stash, uh, Stash Buster number four. So take a look for those videos. I'll put the link down in the notes. Stephanie Boron is asking, why are triangles so challenging? Well, the reason why triangles, so she's talking about half square triangles, often called HSTs. Um, I do have a video on sewing the perfect HST, but the reason why is because normally, like when we're sewing squares, we're sewing with the grain. Um, when we are sewing HSTs, we're sewing on a bias. And it's so important to iron properly with these, otherwise they get so distorted. Um, the other problem is when you have those um, pieces connected in the corners and you're trying to sew those together, they're easily distorted. So I don't know how experienced a quilter you are. If you're just starting, just be patient with yourself because it just takes time. Uh, you, there's the three skills, the cutting, the sewing, and the pressing. And with every quilt, you just keep practicing it and you just get better and better. So go watch my video on sewing straight, go watch my video on HSTs, go watch my video on a really good ironing technique. And quite frankly, the ironing technique for me was a big game changer. It just made such a difference in the shape and the quality of my HSTs. I just didn't realize how important it was. Uh, there's another sigh. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, okay, have you ever, uh, Tina Tippin uh, has just asked, have you ever just grabbed a pile of say two inch strips and just put them together? Um, uh, she's having trouble with having a purpose in mind first. Um, Yes, I've done that. I do that a lot. Um, I actually cut up, I have this, I have this really messy little box that I keep beside my sewing table. And there's days when it's hard to get going. Um, I have two and a half inch squares. I have two and a half inch strips. And I actually have this adding machine tape. And uh, sometimes I turn them into blocks. Um, sometimes I turn them into four patches. Um, and I just use them as leaders and enders sometimes. Sometimes I just do a session just making these, just depending on where my brain is at. Um, it's amazing how these accumulate. This is just kind of two days worth of leaders and headers. Um, I find this is my adding machine improv. These are just scraps, fabrics that I have lying around. Um, and I just sew pieces to this adding machine tape and I just trim it. These are, this one's not trimmed yet, but I will trim it at a quarter of an inch 
and I just keep going with these. And this can be turned into fabric, which you can use in anything. I have a project in mind for it. Um, I think I need a hundred of them to make the quilt that I'm planning, but definitely there are days when I just sew scraps together and go. Um, sometimes it leads to something more. Sometimes it's just enough to get the juices going. Somebody's asked, if you find a fabric in poly cotton that you love and want to use in a quilt, can you use it with other cotton cuts? When you start mixing types of fabric, you need to make sure they're pre-washed because they're going to shrink at different rates. So that's all. Uh, yes, you can use them in a quilt. That's no problem. Just make sure you pre-wash them. Otherwise, you know, you're just going to have a lumpy quilt. It's a little bit different from the shrinkage that uh, happens. Marsha Elliott Kern has asked, do you have any suggestions on what to start on for a beginner? Um, we talked about this earlier in um, the Q&A. Just start with a very simple five inch at the max seven, at the smallest four uh, squares or rectangles and just sew. Um, don't do a, a big quilt, I would say. <laughs> A baby quilt is like around 36 by 36 or 36 by 42, but I really would not do anything larger than like a 50 by 60. Uh, just to get the hang of it. As I said before, you're going to learn so much in your first quilt. It's just... <laughs> Your first three or four quilts, you're just going to learn so much and you just don't want to waste any, uh, you don't want to use the good stuff. You don't want to uh, be working on it for a couple of years just because your skill level is going to improve so much by the end. My friend Karen Ridding is watching. Oh my God, Karen Ridding is one of my oldest school friends. <laughs> I hope you're having a great time up on the lake. <laughs> Susan Brennan has asked, how do you keep your sewing mojo going when you have hundreds of the same block? I'm working on a bucket list called, oh my gosh, I'm making a queen size, lots of one inch pieces. My secret weapon is the timer. I've mentioned this so many times, but um, this, is so important. I find repetitive work you can only do for so long and it's much better to, if you've got four hours of quilting to do. I find it's much better to work two hours on one project, maybe an hour on another and then an hour on another. Um, and I, I've been quite vocal about a, uh, an old UFO that I'm working on, but I'm just working on it 30 minutes at a time and that's just the way you get through some projects. So that's to me the secret um, of getting through a lot of tedious blocks. Um, a lot of people have asked me where to get it. I'll put a link down in the notes. <laughs> Michelle Morris has asked, uh, have I ever backed a quilt with fleece or minky? And do I have any tips on quilting with this? I haven't actually done it, but I've asked a lot of questions because I have actually wanted to do it as well. Um, and the consensus is it's not very difficult to do if you put it on a long arm where you have the um, top and the bottom secured and can control you can control the stretch, but when you're hand sewing it, you've got to be very, very careful with it because stretching is easy. Now, I personally, again, have not done this. This is just going by what people have told me. So um, if you want to do it, I would just be sure that you're basting it very well. Okay. Um, do I ever hand quilt? I'm thinking of trying it. Uh, that's by Linda Morgan. Um, no, I've never hand quilted, but I'm thinking of trying it too. So uh, I'm working on um, a couple of, I've seen a couple of quilts that is a combination of hand sewing and machine quilting and it looks beautiful. It's just absolutely beautiful. I've got a couple people from Tennessee and from Edmonton, Alberta. Very nice to see you. <sighs> And let me see, do we have any other questions here? I would like to build a steady, I'm 
pretty sure the stash without breaking the bank. Any suggestions? Well, um, I would say have a budget. Every month you have a certain amount of money that you put away for um, for your fabric purchase and you can either purchase it monthly or you can purchase it bi-monthly, but it's slow and steady. I belong to a couple of fabric clubs. Um, there was one with Fridays Off that I belong to, and there was one at Sew Sisters that I belong to, and they were very good for building up that stash. Um, now, I didn't like 100% of the fabrics, but it was also good for getting me fabrics that I would never have chosen because they're not in my color zone. So it's just nice to have that broad uh, sense from other people. Um, and that I don't know whether that's in your budget, but I would check them out. Um, there's a lot of uh, sewing clubs, like uh, fabric clubs that you can join. But budget is key. Uh, just have an envelope, put the, the money in it, and uh, spend it when you want. Okay. Um, Bobby Spaulding. She seemed to start a bullet journal, and then she got to a point, like she just fell, fell off the wagon. Well, the great thing about a bullet journal is, and I've said it before, that if you're not using a page, um, just abandon it and start again. Uh, a lot of people go into making a bullet journal and they get too complex. They do too much and they realize it's way too much work to keep it up. Um, just use it for what you need. Uh, don't try to make it more than what you need because anything that's too complicated, you won't keep up. And if you don't, um, yeah, this is just basically, <laughs> it's just that in a nutshell. If it's too complicated or if it's not working for you, if you're trying to keep it too beautiful, uh, you won't use it for the full potential. So just get back on the wagon, figure out what you need and one real key point that I um, have with the bullet journal is you need to review it. Like I have so many notes in here. Um, I have notes on making blocks. I have notes on making videos. I have notes on family issues. I have uh, plans. I have goals. And especially with a year like 2020 where things just seem to be moving and uh, throwing you off the rails. It's so important to go back, think of, review your thoughts and your plans that you had before and see, are you abandoning them? Are you trying to pick them up again? So keep at it. Keep at it. Just make, modify it to make it work for you. Grace Blatch has asked, what tips do you have for keeping the edges of pieces from fraying? So as you become more experienced, the grain of the fabric is going to become more important to you. Uh, so when you're, you're pulling it across the thread, one will come right across. Um, what happens is we have uh, fabrics that are cut off grain and they can be very, just so much comes off them. I actually have one, I don't know what, you can see here. This, this fabric that I, um, I actually didn't correct the grain because it was just off so badly. Like it was almost like 30 degrees. And I thought I, I just didn't have, I wouldn't have any fabric left over. It was just a narrow thing. So that just produces a lot when it's off grain. It just produces a lot of fraying like this. So um, one way you can stop it is by doing it on grain, um, correcting for grain. I think I've got a bit on that in my HST video, but if you're a beginner, I wouldn't worry about that part yet. That's just not to worry about until you get a little bit more experience. But often when we have our quilt blocks, we want to fold them up like this or our fabric up like that but really what you want to do is fold it with the good side out and that way you keep those edges inside and they're not moving around they're not uh, up against other things and there's not the friction so yeah where are we at now <laughs> um, let's see what's one tool that I cannot live without well, the timer, 
for one. Um, this is, this has 60, 50, uh, 60, 30, 15, and five. Um, but the, uh, an actual quilting tool, I have, well, good pair of scissors, good pair of scissors. Um, Hmm. I do have my favorite ruler. My favorite ruler is a two and a half by 18 inch ruler. And it just seems to fit in my hand. I'm cutting two and a half inches often. So um, it just seems to be a very handy shape. Uh, there's no, I mean, we all use snips. We all use um, uh, a stitch ripper. <laughs> <laughs> my stitch ripper is a clover, but I don't have a masking tape. The like a non quilting, like a, the regular stuff. I think the one thing that I could not live without is masking tape. I use it for so many things from making guides on my ruler to taping things together, to putting things up on the wall. Uh, I just use it in so many different places. So um, I, I would say masking tape. Okay. Um, have I done a video yet on the different types and uses for pins? No, but it is on the list of, of uh, videos I do want to make. So uh, stay tuned to that. My favorite um, size is just a Spanish lace size. It's very, very small, but I do use all sorts of different sizes for different jobs. So I'm looking forward to making that video for you. Um, tips on assembling ro rows. I think I probably answered that with the sashing. It's just important, one that you measure, um, and then marking your center of that row. Like if you're doing a row by row, just make sure that you mark your center so that you're, you're, you're getting that center point going up the quilt. And then you, s then <sighs> Is that my fifth or sixth sigh? What design do I recommend for a still learning free motion quilter to quilt on a sewing machine and not a long arm? Um, there is a wonderful course um, called Sewing with the Feed Dogs Down by Melissa Marginet, and she's out of Manitoba. Um, and that's excellent because you don't need to, um, you don't have to lose your feed dogs and just wonderful geometric designs that you can do. Once you get the, the, the feed dogs down, <laughs> then you're running with speed. Now, those ones, I would say there's a really nice one that has waves in it, uh, the pinwheel. The big thing to remember with free motion quilting is it's more about evenness of pattern than it is about getting perfect points and uh, perfection. Um, I'm not a I'm not an expert free motion quilter, but I know that when I'm done and I walk away from it for a day and come back, I'm always shocked at how much more I like the design. When you're in the moment, you can feel everything that's wrong, but as long as you make a consistent overall pattern, I also don't like dense free motion quilting um, because I find it makes the quilt stiff and I like my quilts to be soft. So um, yeah. Um, is there any special formula for knowing what size squares to start with for making different triangles and blocks from? Yes, if you are making a half square triangle, you are, you're taking your finished size and you are adding seven eighths. Now, I always do one inch because it's just tedious to be measuring that seven eighths and that just gives you a little bit of wiggle room um, to square up to. Now I do know master quilters that can cut along that diagonal and make it perfect and not have to trim, but I'm not one of them. So now if you're making a quarter square triangle, uh, that is, that's the one that goes like this with the long edge along the side, you add an inch and a half, uh, sorry, inch and a quarter, inch and a quarter for a quarter square triangle. 
Um, and that's simple math and you can find it online. So you take, remember it's the finish size, not the size of a unsewn quilt block. It's the finish size of the block. Okay. Um, I didn't sigh, didn't sigh. There was somebody that asked me about, um, she was sewing, sorry, I don't have the question here, but she was having problems putting HSTs together. She said she cut properly, she thought she measured properly, and she's still having problems with the blocks together. I would revisit your ironing technique. Um, those corners, you can just get so much fabric in those corners, depending on how those um, half square triangles are coming together. You can't afford to have any distortion in that corner whatsoever. You want, um, and you know, you need to hit that 45 perfectly so that when you sew, um, your, sew them into rows that it just clips that 45, that HST right in the corner. So be patient with yourself. Uh, again, it comes with time. Uh, take it slower, maybe. Um, I don't find pinning always the solution. I find it's much more about having flat blocks that can nest properly into each other. And that has really made a huge difference for me. Uh, somebody was also talking about doing the four at one HST and was having difficulty with that. The problem with the four at one HST, so that's when you take the block and you sew on the outside. Uh, you're sewing along the grain so that when you open it up, all your edges are biased edges. Uh, I don't recommend that method for any beginner unless you're using a heck of a lot of starch to keep that stable. Uh, be very careful with your iron that you're not, you just want to press and be so careful when you're putting them together that you don't stretch them. It's really uh, not my favorite way. Uh, but some, there's a lot of patterns out there for you to do that with uh, charm squares and um, charm squares and uh, layer cakes. I just know that there's a lot of patterns for those. So just be careful when you use that method. Um, are there any colors that I never go to? I never willingly sew with black. Um, I have, but it, I just find it really draining. And even worse than that is gray, like a graphite or something. I'm always, it's just, <laughs> it doesn't work for me. And I would tell you that I don't like to sew with blue, but my last four or five quilts, I think three of them have been blue. So I'm, I guess it's growing on me a bit. Uh, I, I prefer to sew with colors that are, um, you would probably consider a mixture of red, blue, and yellow. Like I don't like to sew with a pure yellow and I don't like to sew with a pure green. I like the, I love lime green and I love an orange yellow and I love a, a purple blue, but I, I don't like those pure things. Those are just not mine. But it's not to say that I, black and gray are truly the only ones that I, I avoid. But <laughs> having said that, I just bought a fat quarter bundle from Higlet Fabrics. Uh, it was a, uh, it was called If Life, I think it's If Life Gives You Lemons, Make Lemonade. It was all with lemons on it and it was support to support the Stratford Festival, which of course is not open because of COVID-19. Uh, uh, so I'm going to have to come up with a pattern for that. But I suspect that a lot of us have the problem of sewing with very, very dark fabrics and very, very light fabrics. So I think maybe that'll be a stash buster coming up. There's so many here, so many, so many questions. Okay, so I think that's it for tonight. Holy mackerel, time went so fast. Uh, I'm going to have a new video out on Tuesday 
It's going to be uh, how I chose the colors for my Meadowland blocks. Uh, you just have a hint of them. They're just off to the side here. And I'm trying to think of what the ones are coming after it. It's probably going to be several ones. I'm hoping to get the book club back on track. Um, and for those of you who are wondering about my son, he's doing very well. He goes in for his fourth chemo next week. So we're keeping our fingers crossed that um, things still progress well. And I thank you all for all your thoughts and prayers. I really do. Thank you so much. Uh, you can catch me on Instagram. You can catch me on Facebook. Don't forget to check my backlist of YouTube videos. There's lots in there. I know there's a lot of new people to my channel. Lots of good videos. Um, and lots of free patterns and other handouts on my website at Just Get It Done Quilts. So thank you all for showing up. Just so happy to see you from all over the world. Uh, lots of good questions. Lots and lots of good questions. So take care and I'll see you next time.